Hi, this is Catherine reporting for Kids First. Today, I'm joined with my team member, Sahiba, to interview Dr. Barry Sandrew, a member of the Board of Advisors at Immersive Hollywood, which is a section of Digital Hollywood, and he is a Harvard MGH neuroscientist. Dr. Sandrew is an internationally recognized expert in digital imaging and visual effects pioneer. He has over 33 patents and decades of feature film and TV accomplishments, including productions for all the major Hollywood studios, TV networks, and several cable networks. In 2000, Dr. Sandrew established the first and longest operating VFX studio in India. He produced all color compositing and VFX for Spielberg's first digital animated feature. We're back, a dinosaur story. VFX for Scorsese's The Aviator, HBO's Entourage, and oversaw creative and technical teams in 3D conversion of Alice in Wonderland, the Shrek trilogy, and oh, so much more. So it's a pleasure to have you with us here today, um, Barry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, as Catherine and I were just saying, you've had an absolutely fascinating career, um, but it all began with neuroscience. So how has your PhD in neuroscience impacted your visual effects and digital imaging career? Yeah, that's a question everybody asked me. You know, I was very fortunate in being involved with several technical fields that were in their pioneering stages when I entered them. I had no idea they were in their pioneering stages, but that's where they were. And it was easier to uh, create a mark in those fields uh, uh, at that stage. And I'm talking about uh, neuroscience, medical imaging, and uh, feature filmmaking. A good portion of my work in neuroscience involved medical imaging. And this was during, again, the pioneering days when medicine was just discovering the value of digital imaging through the use of MRIs, you know, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, PET scans, uh, positron emission tomography, and CT, computerized tomography scans. Uh, this was all new stuff. Today, it's commonplace. But much, much of what I learned from my work in medical imaging, I applied to my early work in movie making. Indeed, how we perceive patterns has been studied to improve the diagnostic value of medical imaging for many, many years, for many decades, as a matter of fact. And one of the primary parameters in medicine has been the introduction of color, which effectively adds unique resolution uh, to the diagnostic process. And that's one of the things that I was very involved with and, uh, and, and really how I got into colorization originally. You see visual effects, including colorization and 3D in movies are nothing but illusions, you know that. Um, in order to make those illusions effective and appear natural, even if you're creating fantasy or sci-fi where images are not necessarily natural, they're not supposed to be natural, it's important to understand the neuroscience of the human visual system and how we perceive the world. This is most true in 3D. Our stereoscopic vision, because of our two eyes, is something that's very forgiving in most cases because of monocular cues. We can see uh, 3D um, with one eye. There are a lot of cues like uh, oh, texture and, and uh, a whole bunch of other things uh, that, that give you 3D cues. Um, but it, sometimes 3D cannot, will not be forgiving. There are limits, in other words, there are limitations to how much 3D you can push. If you push the 3D too far and put it into the audience uh, to the point where, uh, you know, it's, it's hitting the back of the back of the theater, um, you can make people sick or tired. So watching a three, and, and watching 3D in a movie theater is a very unnatural thing. Um, it, it's not like how our visual system normally works. If I put my finger up in front of me, and I use one eye and then the other eye, it jumps. That's because each eye is looking at a different, uh, it, different perspective of my finger. But in a movie theater, um, there's not one thing there. I, basically, all you're looking at is, a, is the movie screen. Everything you're seeing, whether it's, in, it, it's behind you or in front of you, all the way in infinity, it's all on that screen. And your eyes are not converging. In fact, that you can't converge. So you're basically taking your system, your visual system apart and creating 3D. And, and that's not, uh, a lot of people can't handle that. So you really have to do it 
in a very, very specific way. And, and I studied that from a neuroscience perspective to make it work. Uh, you need to create 3D that enhances a story without being uncomfortable. So neuroscience uh, really was effective and it really helped me in 3D, in developing 3D, but also in, in color as well, because color perception also has a, has a major neuroscience base. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. Thank you. So you have over 33 patents, which involve a lot of new ways of looking at things. So what do you attribute your creativity to our new perspective as it relates to these patents and all the things that you've pioneered? Well, you know, I, I think it requires looking at the world with a unique perspective. That is, seeing things that are obvious to you that are not necessarily obvious to other people. And uh, I don't know if that's learned, I don't know if it's, it, it, or, or whether, uh, whether you're born with it, to be very frank with you. But all my patents came from my entrepreneurial career. There was uh, another advantage in neuroscience in my early entrepreneurial career. When I started out in neuroscience, again, um, it was in the early days. Uh, when I got my doctorate, by the way, um, there was no neuroscience department at Stony Brook University. There was a biology department and there was a psychology department. And the psychology department was into physiological psychology and I had to actually cross between the two disciplines. So that's how early uh, it was that I actually uh, got into it. Um, so um, when, when I got into neuroscience, there were, there were no tools. Today you can buy books that have catalogs that have all of these tools for studying neuroscience. There was nothing like that. I had to borrow from other disciplines and make things work um, uh, to, uh, to study the brain. Um, and and very, it was very much true with uh, um, colorization in Hollywood. I also, I mean, Hollywood was, was not digital at all. It, it, it was still analog. Uh, it, digital in Hollywood didn't happen in the year 2000. So I had to improvise and invent um, tools to colorize black and white movies um, that didn't exist. Um, they existed in other disciplines, but I had to bring them in. So anyway, uh, I, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it did. <laughs> and so at what point in your career did you realize that, that this was like a unique skill of yours? Well, I, I think that, that that happened when I started to write scientific grants and scientific papers. Um, I realized that I had a knack for creative writing. Creative writing is very important in science. Um, you're not making things up, but you, but, but uh, obviously, you know, when you do, when you actually make a discovery, uh, it's important for you to be able to look where that discovery is going and how it's going to be used and what implications it has and that sort of thing. And of course, you want to make it as profound as possible. I had what I consider a unique insight into problems and their solutions. The same was true in solving problems in filmmaking. When uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs came to me and asked me to invent a, a process for colorizing black and white movies, well, I, I, I drew from all of the work I had been doing in medical imaging and digital me medical imaging. And you, believe it or not, the solution came to me instantly. If somebody else who had not, who didn't have all the experience that I had uh, in, in digital medical imaging, again, which was very new, would not have the same perspective. So I was able to instantly figure that out. The same was true with 3D. When I invented uh, the process for converting movies from 2D to 3D, uh, th that solution uh, came to me pretty much instantly. That's so interesting. Uh, and um, so you were mentioning um, your um, sort of career with colorization as well. And I noticed that you invented colorization, but then you went back and reinvented it. So what drove you to better your previous inventions? Well, when I colorized black and white movies initially, um, once again, I have to go back to the fact that uh, digital Hollywood had not happened. Digital Hollywood is a term that came about in 2000. Uh, in 1987, when I left Harvard to invent uh, colorization, there had never been a movie that was fully digitized. In other words, you could not put one onto a, a CD or something of that nature. Um, 
it, it, you could you could put it on a, a, a laser disc in analog form, but uh, you couldn't really uh, uh, put it on a disc. Uh, not that there were many discs then uh, to be to use had to be used anyway. I don't think we I don't know if we even had floppies back then. But um, you don't even know what a floppy is, do you? But, so, so, any, so anyway, so I used a lot of these crude techniques uh, to, uh, to, to create colorization. Um, but in 2000, when I decided to redo it, um, there were much more powerful computers. I didn't even have a network um, back in 87. There were no networks. There were no PC networks that you could use. So everything had to be um, sneaker netted. Uh, we had to take uh, uh, Bernoulli discs, which were a type of uh, uh, medium that was very crude today, but back then it was it was really advanced. And we had to basically walk it over to the different people working on them, and they they'd put one disc in, and and uh, they'd see what was going on. They'd they'd work on it, take that disc out, put it somewhere else. Networks didn't exist. So in 2000, um, again, there were more powerful computers. Uh, there were uh, there was Im image processing technology that was very advanced that I could use. It was much more efficient, and um, the quality was much more much better. Not only that, but when I originally colorized, I did it in standard definition, which was low resolution. Um, in 2000, I was able to colorize in high definition, so I was able to get a lot more out of it and look much more realistic. That's amazing how much, you know, technology changes just in a matter of a few years. Yeah, yeah. seriously. So you've started a lot of companies and led a lot of projects. So what are some of the most important qualities and people that you look for when you're building teams? Well, um, I, I, I have two answers for that, really, because... Uh, the, the, the qualities I looked for a long time ago are different than what I would look for now. But um, fr frankly, um, the studio that the studios that I've opened, I've had four studios. Um, I like to hire young people who were interested in um, in in art, um, and I, I used to get a lot of students that graduated from the Art Institute um, here in San Diego. Uh, they had an interest in getting into show business and the entertainment business, but you know their chances of getting into the entertainment business were uh, slim to none because it's very competitive. Um, and the technology that I invented for colorization for 3D was very um, uh, uh, very simplistic. In other words, I wanted to create an interface, a user interface that uh, any, I could train somebody in a couple of days to do. I could train somebody in a day to do. What that meant is, what, what being, well, I, what I did was I brought them in and within two weeks, they were working on first run feature films. Can you imagine that in San Diego? You graduate from uh, a vocational school, uh, the Art Institute, and within two weeks, you're working on a, a Spider-Man or a Man of Steel or The Walk or any of these great movies by fa famous uh, directors. Uh, and, you know, what I wanted to find were people who understood that this was a stepping stone. That's so awesome that you've started so many people's jobs and such important things. And yeah, good listeners are very important because I guess once you're a good listener, pretty much always a good listener. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's not a matter of, only a matter of listening. It's a matter of, it's really a matter of doing. Mm -hmm. And they, so a lot of the stuff that you've seen on, uh, in, in some of the, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland be a perfect example, which was the first film I had done uh, just after I did Michael Jackson's This Is It tour. I did uh, Alice in Wonderland. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, and then another emerging field um, is like augmented reality and virtual reality. And um, I believe that's something you're currently working on. Um, so how do you think augmented reality is going to um, change the film watching experience? Well, virtual, you're going to get an answer from me that's probably not going to be the same as you get from most other people. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't believe that virtual reality is going to find a mass market. Um, I think it's too costly and it's, it's too isolate. It's an isolation type of uh, experience. 
when you put that headgear on, you put your earphones on, you're totally isolated. And we don't do things that way. We're social, we're social animals. You go to a movie, you go, go to a movie with somebody else, typically. You don't go alone. And you like to watch, people like to watch movies together. So to experience something in VR, yes, it's cool. And a lot of people, I, I mean, inevitably, any, pretty much everybody who puts on a headset and experiences something in virtual reality says, that's really cool. And then you say, well, let me show you something else. And they say, no, I'm good. You know, they, they've had it, in other words. But augmented reality and, and mixed reality, which is more important, are totally different because it, it, those are social uh, experiences. And this is something I, I always like to bring up because it's something that I, I worked on for a while. Uh, you could go into a Starbucks, for instance, and using your, your, your mobile phone, you could, um, uh, you could look at a corner of the Starbucks and on a table that, that's similar to the one you're, sit, you're sitting at, but it's not really there, uh, could be piped into your, your phone and overlaid onto the corner of that Starbucks. And at that table, people could come in, actors, actresses that are, that are volumetric. In other words, they look 3D. And you can actually walk around them and see different things about them. Uh, one of them could be looking at a uh, FaceTime, and you can actually see the FaceTime if you go over to it, but they are not there. They're all, they're all streamed in onto your phone or onto your, your, your glasses. That's just one example of, of, of the type of uh, entertainment value you can get out of, out of uh, a mixed reality. Mm. Yeah, but all your insights are so wonderful. And um, just hearing you talking about augmented reality and the possible future of it, it gets me really excited, you know, when just when you think you can't do anything else, you know, in film to make it um, cool, you know, there's always something out there. Um, but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you here. I've learned so much personally in this interview. And unfortunately, I would love to talk to you, you know, the rest of the day and hear everything, you know, you have to share. But um, that's going to be it for today. And thank you so, so much once again for being here with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. And please be sure to like subs and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next interview or film reviews. See you later. Bye.